Today on the river, living the St. Lawrence. Did they know the, you know, the ramifications of building a wood structure and on the St. Lawrence River? That building inspector that had a fourth grade education, so <laughs> we're surrounded by water, so let's just build everything with wood. We've got nothing to worry about. The guys talk about the history of the St. Lawrence River, the famous people who lived on it, and the castles they built. Plus, we'll learn about the origins of the Eisenhower Locks and the beginnings of the seaway itself. That's today on this episode of The River, Living the St. Lawrence. On today's show, the guys talk about the river's rich and profound history. Of course, there's never enough time to talk about the greatest river in the world. So today is part one of two shows dedicated to the river's history. Producers Josh Todd and Alex Hammond wanted to create a show that was solely dedicated to the St. Lawrence River. That's why they created a roundtable discussion with host Glenn Curry to talk about the river's rich history its contributions to world trade, and its growing popularity with the best anglers on the planet. Without further delay, let's join part one of the history of the St. Lawrence River with Josh, Alex, and Glenn. A couple of Round Island, Frontenac Island. So it's, it's, two, it's the island with two names, Josh. Which right. is it? Is it Round Island or Frontenac? <laughs> right now it goes by Round Island, but the Frontenac Post Office is still current, still delivering mail. Uh, so island residents can go pick up their mail there too. But yeah, it's, it's been born of a couple of names. It's got its own post office there. Where, mm -hmm. where exactly is uh, Round Island? So it's right northeast of Clayton and mm -hmm. just a little bit downriver. So there's a little Round Island just north of it. Mm -hmm. And Round Island is not round at all. It's more cigar shaped, if anything. But um, it was named Frontenac for the hotel that was built there too. Now, we did a little research. The actual hotel was built in uh, 1899. It was only stood standing there in Frontenac or Round Island for 12 years. It burned down in 1911, like so many other wood structures. Uh, so let's for, for, uh, first start off by asking the question, did they know the, you know the ramifications of building a wood structure on the St. Lawrence River that if anything did go wrong, they, they wouldn't have the ability to put it out? They certainly didn't have any know, means that, to do so. That building inspector that had a fourth grade education, so <laughs> we're surrounded by water, so let's just build everything with wood. We've got nothing to worry about. But, I mean, as far as hotels and, and structures burning down, it went from the Frontenac to the Hubbard House to the Calumet Castle, Thousand Islands Park, River Edge Resort, Hub House, Hub Island, or Hub House on Hub Island, right. the Grindstone House and the Columbia Hotel. And it, and it might just, be something that, you know, is taken for granted today, but probably because of the heating sources they had to use back then. Mm -hmm. I mean, turn of the century, you're still using, I'm guessing, fireplaces, wood stoves, coal, uh, coal, uh, kerosene, you know, they, to heat these large, huge places that I'm sure had horrible insulation. Right. Um, you know, somebody's staying up stoking the fireplace. Right. With the front of that hotel specifically, burned down by the by the use of a cigarette and a strange irony, which we'll get to later. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, they all have succumbed to fire at some point. And it's he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. You, you know, just, uh, just <laughs> like we heard the famous story. And we'll get, like you said, uh, Josh, we'll get to that. <laughs> but uh, the St. Lawrence, the history of all the hotels and not the, not to mention the, the, the actual uh, railroad systems mm -hmm. that came out of New York, Rome, Watertown, famous that was built before the civil war. 
And it just indicated uh, that despite the fact that the weather was no different than it is today, we didn't have the means to have air conditioning or heating like we do today. But a lot of people came up here because of the lumber industry and the, mm-hmm. what eventually became the paper industry. So there were a lot of people here that were taking advantage of this newfound land in northern New York. We had a lot of people from New York City that came up here because they not only were exploring the Adirondacks, as we know, but they were also exploring the river. And within that context, uh, guys like George Bolt, uh, guys like uh, Emery, like you mentioned before, they saw opportunities because they saw all this beautiful nature. They probably bought these islands for pennies on the dollar, Mm -hmm. but they realized because of the railroad system that there was a means to bring up people up here so they can enjoy it. So that was started, the railroad started up here in 1856, if I'm not mistaken, before the Civil War, if you can think of that, uh, and then branched out into other areas, including Clayton, Cape Vincent, and Alex Bay. So now, all of a sudden, you didn't have automobiles, of course, you didn't even have electricity, but you had a lot of people that were able to come up from the uh, from downstate and other areas of the country to come up here. Certainly should see a lot more of that, Josh, but as if you're going to get a lot of people and exposure up here, you're going to have to have accommodations. The allure doesn't disappear. That's a, the crazy part about the river. It's it's been on people's psyche since the beginning of time and mm-hmm. since Columbus came across here, and we could chew that apart if we want to. But sure. um, they've had portages from the east, eastern side of Lake Ontario and Chameau Bay all the way to uh, Clayton, and that's where the terminus for the railroads was there too. And I've seen pictures of ladies in their fancy dresses and men in top hats just vacationing. They'll get on a train in New York City, and, and they'll head up here. I think they would stop off in Utica. There's still some nice trains down in Utica too, but sure. there was a draw here. And they would recreate up here, and it was just where they would spend their summertime. And they had the money to do it. Like you said, they bought islands for, for very cheap, and some mm-hmm. guys would scoop them all up at 10, 15 at a time mm-hmm. and then start doling them out to the people that he knew as buddies. And the interesting part is it's it's like the oil tycoons and the Rockefellers and the turn of the century people like for uh, George Bolt mm-hmm. and even down to the Singer Castle owner for the, the right. Singer sewing machine. Exactly. The money was here. Even if you weren't affluent, you could come enjoy the river on right. your skiff or on your canoe and, and right. fish and, and mess around in all the wallows that the, the rich people got. This You just couldn't uh, belly up to their boats and, and maybe enjoy the, the same food and, and wine that they had, but mm-hmm. you're on the same location and enjoying the same spot. So it's mm-hmm. got a lot of history, mm-hmm. and I don't think that'll ever go away. No, it isn't. Time. I mean, you go into Clayton right now, you go to O'Brien's, you see a cross-section of a lot of people mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> that represent a lot of uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. One island uh, that I'm fascinated with that we didn't talk about, guys, I'll bring up right now, is Carlton Island. Yes, And there's cool. a big, big home there that, you know, this beautiful structure, it had its own uh, ballroom on the third floor, it had the old-fashioned and toilets like from the godfather where you pulled you could still see that at least you could a couple of years ago it's in disrepair now for obvious reasons it's uh but uh, so that he had succumbed to you know uh, poverty unfortunately after the fall of the stock market in 1929 like so many other people did was that the beginning of the end of the saint lawrence uh, heydays uh, josh from what you you know i think it's just like the river that ever runs through it's just another rebirth it's just out with the old in with the new but the new will carry on traditions of the old and Carlton Island, I don't know if you are aware of the, at the head of the island, they have Fort Haldimand. And that's got a lot of history back to the 1812, uh, War of 1812. Um, as far as my research and everything I can find, that was the only land that changed hands during the War of 1812 with the British and the French and all, everyone competing for this area. Wow. So, um, a lot of history on that. They've been exploring that area at the head of the island, an old fortified structure there, and they've done ground penetrating radar. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's even talks of gold being lost there at one point, but there's some pretty famous figures that, that show up at Carlton Island, and Carlton Island specifically. But mm-hmm. the history here is just so deep. Uh, it would take hours and hours to just break it all down and, and talk about all the connections that people have to the area. But, but there's over 2,200 islands yes. uh, in, the, in the Thousand Islands, and they start from the face uh, from the opening uh, right there at, uh, at Cape Vincent and go all the way up the river. How far do the uh, islands continue up through Waddington, uh, Alex? I mean, if you want to count the ones that we have, uh, we've got Ogden Island. We have one called Bird Island. It's a lot smaller now since the seaway went through. But, I mean, the islands continue. Mm-hmm. Where does the Thousand Islands end? I think that's where your imagination ends. Ooh, I like I, that. I still consider, <laughs> I consider uh, us still part of the Thousand Islands. Well, are there islands beyond the locks up towards Montreal? Do they have islands still in the middle? Oh, yes. of the, okay, oh, yeah. I, I've never been up in that region. If you get on a boat and then you have enough money to put fuel in your tank you can head all the way out to labrador and and the uh, atlantic ocean so Mm -hmm. uh, a couple locks along the way but you it's it's an open it's an open path to either the east coast or right down through the uh, center of the great lakes all the way up to lake superior so it's it's well traveled there's books and videos and series on it and 
people just make the best of it. Either you're fishing or you're, or you're traveling through. So uh, once you open up to Labrador, and that's where Jacques Cartier came in, mm-hmm. just by uh, we're going a little bit farther back, but mm-hmm. um, those were his two beginning. trips. Yeah, yeah, those were his two trips that came in through uh, through Labrador and, and up at St. Lawrence. I think he made it as far as the Lachine Rapids, and uh, with met with some resistance because the water was so shallow. But that's, right. that's right. where the the Seaway Development Corp came in and and made it to the seaway that it is today. But how long, how, how long did it take to build the actual lock system? Oh, boy. 1959, I think, is when they started. It was 55, 55 to 59. Yeah, 55 they opened, to 59. About four years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's amazing. I mean, the, you know, the engineering spirit that Americans have, mm-hmm. uh, not to mention that we're, we're, we're off the beaten course here, uh, but uh, the, the Erie Canal was built and completed in 1825, if you could think of that. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. It was called Clinton's Ditch, and they started from Buffalo and then from Albany, and they kind of met in between. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, that same engineering, obviously, years later, helped build the, the Panama Canal. Getting back to the islands, we talked about Frontenac, and uh, we talked a little bit about Carlton Island. Let's go to the most famous island. I know it's probably the, most, the one story that a lot of people know a lot of, uh, but there's a lot of people out there who don't know the story of Hart Island and George Bolt. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just one of those guys came over as an immigrant, like so many other people at the turn of the century or prior to the uh, year 1900, uh, with just pennies in his pocket from, I think, from Hungary. And uh, he, uh, he built the big uh, Waldorf Astoria in, in, in Manhattan. And then uh, somehow or other, he, he, he learned about the Thousand Islands, fell in love with it, bought the Hart Island, and built the most famous castle in the Thousand Islands that went into disrepair. We all know the story. His wife died in 1904. That's when construction completely stopped. But recently, they brought it back to life. Uh, and uh, Alex, let me ask you, what, what are your thoughts about the new and improved uh, uh, Bolt Castle in the last 10, 20 years? It's amazing. You know, like the, the entire story from beginning to end, and then, you know, at the end of that story would be, you know, 1977 when they actually, you know, bought it for a dollar, uh, the Thousand Islands uh, Bridge and Port Authority. Uh, and what's great about that is every single cent that they made in revenues goes back to actually restoring the mansion. And they don't want to build anything more, even though they have the plans. Mm-hmm. They just want to make sure that everything there uh, is brought to life where it, where they, where it would have been. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's great. I mean, you see a new, I think what's awesome about it is every time you go to Bolt Castle, mm-hmm. you'll see something new. Exactly. Because they're consistently always going to be doing work there. Mm-hmm. Um, my grandparents tell me stories of when they used to go there, you know, in the 60s with a boat and just walk through there, right? you know, just because it was the cool thing to do when you were yeah. a kid in the 60s. Right. Um, but now you can go there and it's, it's a whole, you make a whole day out of it you, with, uh, with the different services you have for tours. You can hear about the stories we're talking about today with Bill Johnson and different mm-hmm. things like that and take the whole tour that ends at Bolt Castle and go going through the Bolt Castle tours. So I, I think it's great. Weddings as well? Oh my God. Not I to mean, mention. The, the picturesque, just, oh, yeah. just when you think Thousand Islands, mm-hmm. I think Bolt Castle. Yeah. Not to mention the boathouse across the way, which amazingly has survived all this time because oh, yeah. it's one big timber structure yeah, that's yeah. just, yeah. thank God that hasn't gone up. doesn't need to be heated, that's why. Is that what it is? <laughs> yeah. But again, one of many uh, uh, you know, structures on all the islands. But again, when you take one of the boat tours, either you know, uh, Uncle Sam boat tours from the Thompson family, mm-hmm. those people, those young kids, a lot of them are college kids, they have to know a lot about history because they're going past uh, Manhattan Island uh, where Abraham and Strauss from A&S store of fame, uh, I believe they were twin brothers. One was on the Titanic, the other one wasn't. Or mm-hmm. whatever. You hear all yeah, these yeah. things. So it's, it's fascinating to know, to know all that. And then, you, then they point over the edge of the boat and say, oh, we're going to cross over something really important here. And it's the international line and everyone gets uh-huh. hoodwinked on that. <laughs> so it's a great experience. But it, again, tourism is key. Mm-hmm. And we're getting tourists all over the world. A lot of Chinese nationalists are coming through here and bus tours up from New York. They're, they're doing the whole route through Thousand Islands over to Niagara Falls. So when they see something like Bull Castle and they learn more about the history, which we're talking about, that's the big key ingredient to, to, to bring them back here more and more. So, uh, again, a lot of that is happening right now. We talked about how fishing is going to bring a, a more prosperous uh, future. But the history itself is something that should be reflected on. Uh, and I, unfortunately, I don't think of any movie that has ever ha- t- taken place in uh, the Thousand Islands that I can think of. But well, I've, I've got one of them. Oh, what, what's that? I've got a cameo. Okay. Uh, it was the Skulls. Yep, the Skull and Bones. Was yeah. So they use Singer Castle, which actually coincidentally is a, a castle I grew up on as a young man mm-hmm. um, before they opened it to the public. And my buddy's dad was a caretaker, so I would spend lots of summers out there on a castle that just was falling into disrepair again. They had some uh, church services in the, in the chapel, but uh, it was Skulls or Skull and Bones. I can't remember it's, what the, It's called Skulls. Skulls, but it's, it's touching on the Skull and Bones Society for Yale University. Hmm. And... In one of the shots, they have, a, 
I think it's Paul Walker. Is yep. that the guy? Yeah. In a shot heading out towards Singer Castle. So Paul Walker from uh, from Fast, Fast and, and Furious. Furious guy, oh, yeah. well, the best part about mm-hmm. that is yeah. the real one is in the Thousand Islands. Yes. Skull and Bone yep. Society has an, a private island that really? they take their members to. I want to say it's Pine Island. I'll have to look it up yeah. in the show notes. But. Yep. but but it's cool that they, they I think they were trying to use the actual island. Right. Um, and then they couldn't get it. So they were like, well, they saw Singer Castle on their way to right. like take the boat to her past the real one. And Singer Island, Singer Castle was like, yeah, sure. Why and people were, uh, there was a family living in it up until, I believe, until the 80s. On Singer, uh, Singer Castle. I did not know that. Yes, yes it which, was uh, wow. Dr. Martin. And um, I think he was either dual citizenship or I can't remember the whole history. But yeah, and the caretakers have been there ever since just maintaining it. And there's a uh, humongous generator system there that the actual Smithsonian wanted to get their hands on. Hmm. And uh, the owners were able to keep it there. But if you go paw around and you'll see these big levers and the huge generator system. and. Right. Uh, boat houses have been restored, but yeah, I used to just barrel around that island and just hidden passageways before they were open. That's to what the they public. said. Oh, yeah. it, was, it was great. Have you ever seen the movie Me, Myself, and Irene? Uh, I, it Jim takes Carey? place in Messina. Well, they talk about Messina, but I don't think they ever. No, I don't think filmed. they did. <laughs> but yeah, uh, the, it, uh, the main character there had hit a bald eagle in Messina, <laughs> which is why she had to go to Messina, and that's why Jim Carrey's character had to actually. Take her is that the reason? I, you know, it's a to, goofy movie. Yeah, and the actual uh, murder scene in the beginning, where the two agents get killed in the motel, takes place in Messina, and they go back to Rhode Island. I think it t- most of it takes place in Providence, Rhode yeah, Island, right, which I think right. where the writer is originally from. But you know what? It just came to me. Fear No Evil was a movie that was made in the seventies, an answer to oh, the Omen, Carrie, and The Exorcist. You know, all those horror movies right. and whatnot. But Fear No Evil, someone a, a, a directed from the Rochester area, I believe. His family had property up here, and they loved Bolt Castle. And yes, he filmed a lot of the zombie scenes there. Now it was about Lucifer; it was about the devil right, and all right, that right. being born in. They actually shot scenes uh, in DePaulville, one of the churches there, if you could believe that. It was a B movie. I don't know if you know that term, but it's today they'll call it like an independent or whichever. But uh, it was cheaply made. But there were some actors and actresses that you might have recognized. But you know what? At the end of the day, it wasn't bad. But they showed. Bolt Castle when it was in disrepair. That right, was done right. in the late, late 70s when, like you said, people could just literally walk on the island yeah. and broken windows, graffiti all over the place. So when the uh, when they went in there and fixed that, and like you said, they fix one room per year. So there's always something right. in yeah, And then by the time they're done, they're going to have to go back to the beginning again. And what I love about the restoration project that they do at Bolt Castle is just like if you've ever seen Pickens Hall in mm-hmm. Hewelton, mm-hmm. they leave some of the walls what they were before they actually, right. so you can actually see this is where it was. This mm-hmm. is where we are now. And it's better. I like that better than just seeing photos of what it used to look like. They have the photos too, right. but it's, it's cool to be able to see that's what it would look like if people hadn't come in and cared enough to, to refurbish To restore it. Yeah. yeah. The, the same thing with uh, Grand Central Station in New York City. Uh, exactly. Jackie Onassis uh, was very instrumental in saving that. Believe it or not, they were going to tear down Grand Central mm. Station just like everything else. But there is a part in the ceiling where they still show what it looked like uh, prior to uh, the restoration. You take a boat tour and you see all those beautiful Victorian style homes on both sides of the river. That's on the Canadian side and our side. How in the world? Did they build all those houses back in the day before before power tools, you know, electrical tools and so forth? How'd they do it, Alex? I mean, well, I own a stone house from 1825. And I, like I said the last episode, I'm actively refurbishing a bathroom right now. We, mm-hmm. we literally pulled up three different types of flooring in order to get to the original floorboards. Mm-hmm. But every single time I walk in the basement or I'm looking at the structure, I go, how in the world? You, you think it would take them so long and, and you know, not to bring this up to a crazy level, but you think the same thing about the pyramids. How they how they do it? You right. know, people. I think it really comes down to uh, the motivation mm-hmm. of people. Uh, like we've always talked about, these people saw something here. They wanted to be part of what was happening here, and they said, "You know, we have the money to do it. Let's do it." But these days, to build a house, uh, you, you have to jump through hoops to build a home these days. Right. And now, again, they didn't have the ordinance that we had now. They didn't have the regulations in, in as far as how close your house could be to the edge of the, of the island. Does that hold back uh, developers from, from, uh, from coming up here and, and building the next hotel, Alex? Yes and no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've never been a huge fan of red tape. That's why, you know, specifically at the at the town level, I think there's so much red tape out there and some of it needs to be there. I do I do agree some of it needs to be there. Mm-hmm. But I've always thought as far as our local code enforcement, our local laws and whatnot, we should be there to help 
people through the process as much as possible, not hinder them. Right. So we try to work with people as much as humanly possible. Um, a lot of the waterfront property, like I said, in Waddington is either owned by the town or by private citizens. And they are thinking about that in, in the long run. Uh, I know they've thought about deed restrictions mm -hmm. uh, for, I know there's one guy he owns, there's, there's a road, right? And then there's, there's probably about 500 feet of waterfront. Mm -hmm. And on the other side of the road, he owns all that land too. Mm -hmm. So he has actively thought about putting deed restrictions on any lots that he sells on the waterfront side so that mm -hmm. you can't have over like a one and a half story house so that whoever builds on the other side can still have water view and whatnot. So smart. I think there are certain times where, you know, it might be like, oh, I just want to build this huge mansion like right next to the water. Right. But then you'd be, you know, actively taking that away from somebody who could build a house across the road and have water view. As true. Well. So yeah. I think when you think about the greater good and, and the greater uh, responsibility now. I think we have a good uh, thought process on it, but still, at the end of the day, it, it takes so much to build a house nowadays. Just, just, just money wise, yeah. you know, and, and trying to get a contractor that's uh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> yeah that, I know a couple. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and just to get the materials, like I said, over to these islands from the mainland, it's it's, it's very very difficult. Well, the quarry for both Boat Castle and Singer Castle were from. I want to say Ironsides Island. And there's a rookery there for, for blue herons now, but we really? quarried a lot of stone from the actual seaway and from the islands that were, that were close by. But again, the manpower, sawing lumber from, they probably bought sawmills out there yeah, to the islands right. to, to do all this stuff, but they had the money to do it as well. Right, so right. They, had, they had some dollar bills to throw around. To, well, my house to build in Waddington, their, all the stone came from the river. Yep. And... There are like three, maybe there's, I think there's close to 10 homes that were all built around the same time. There were Scottish Masons that came up from New York City and they wow. built the Ogden mansion on Ogden Island. And then all the Ogden's buddies were like, hey, could you come to my house next year and build, yeah. or come to my land next year and build me a house? Sure. And it almost is like, if you look around, you see the stone houses in Waddington. It's like they went from here. The next year they built this one. The next year they built that one. And mm -hmm. it's just, they were experts at their trade mm -hmm. and they did exactly what they were supposed to do. And uh, they did it quick. Did we build boats along the uh, St. Lawrence? I mean, the, the, you know, the, uh, the boat, the, the antique boat museum in Clayton, mm -hmm is historic it's probably the best antique boat museum in the planet that's a big so, draw so it is it's, it's a big draw and people from all over the country who are into wooden boats chris crafts and whatnot have, have, didn't have a clue about it but did we make boats on the saint lawrence river yeah so in the war of 1812 every single boat that we made for the navy was made in uh, ogdensburg new york wow uh, and not to mention sackets was a big area it was the last deep sea port mm -hmm. Uh, because back then you had the rapids. Right. So the last place you could go before you hit the rapids from the Great Lakes was Ogdensburg. So anything, for the, it, the, the shipping yard is right where Fort the De La Presentations land is mm -hmm. now right there. Mm -hmm. So over the years that's been contaminated and contaminated with different things, but now it's finally getting to a place where they can rebuild the fort right mm -hmm. where the lighthouse is. But a lot of the ships were built right there, put into to harbor right in that last deep sea port, and then put down the river right into the Great Lakes. It's amazing. We have a place on Point Peninsula that looks at Sackets and Henderson Harbor from the other side of Henderson Bay, if you will. And it's just amazing to note that there was a war that took place yes. there. And, and ships sank and men died. Yep. Uh, and we often think that wars are somewhere else. And we had the luxury of, obviously, as a country and where we're located and our might, for that matter, we had the ability to go elsewhere to fight our wars. But uh, other than the Revolutionary War, uh, War of 1812, and of course the Civil War, uh, all the other wars were pretty much somewhere else. But to think to, that there were ships coming here from York, which is now Toronto, and that you know were, were, were sunk and people didn't get back to where they originated from, mm -hmm. that's just amazing stuff, folks. So the history here because of the War of 1812 and everything up the river, guys, is, is just fantastic. Thanks to Ancestry.com, yes. I was able to find out that my fourth great-grandfather, Benjamin Hammond, uh, served at Sackett's Harbor. Did he really? Yeah, he was he ha he was one of the first people to live in Henderson, not Henderson Harbor, but mm -hmm. the town of Henderson. Mm -hmm. He's on the original roll of like the first people to live there. And that was in 1810. Wow. And then when the war broke out, he was mustered in with the rest of the troops and I know that Ulysses S. Grant yeah. did a tour there as a lieutenant. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. The right across the way here is the now the uh, the Woodruff uh, 
well, they call it the Woodruff Medical Building, but that's where the Woodruff Hotel was. Mm. And on the second floor, there was a balcony. It might have been the third floor, but I know uh, Ulysses S. Grant came up here when he was president. He was president, obviously, after the Civil War in the early 1870s. But he stood there. The place was packed with people, as you can imagine, like many other presidents, when a president would be here, or a senator, like Senator uh, R. 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 Robert Kennedy and whatnot. Everyone would come down here and watch him. But he did mention his days as a lieutenant, uh, in Sackett's Harbor, right across the way from here. So we're sitting in a very historic spot for obvious reasons, but that, that, that's one of the reasons why we're talking about this area, the Thousand Islands, plus uh, Lake on, East and Lake Ontario, and how people gravitated here and all the history behind it. Let me ask you, Alex, you're both young guys and whatnot. What was the first historic story that you remembered growing up about the river? It would have to be the story of the Ogden family. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Ogden family came to Waddington uh, before it was even Waddington. Um, they they owned a lot of the land up here uh, along with Joshua Waddington. Mm -hmm. But the story was there was this huge, huge mansion that they built on Ogden Island. And unfortunately, uh, unlike what we've been talking about a lot today where it was destroyed by fire, uh, yeah. it was actually destroyed uh, purposefully by the owner because mm. they believed that when the seaway was built, it was going to have to be torn down anyway. Wow. So the, the worst part about that story is um, if you look at where the foundation is, it would have been saved. Oh, my goodness. It would have been fine. It would have still been there. It would have still been there. Uh, it was built in the late 1700s. Uh, rumors are that uh, I'm sure we can cover a whole episode on uh, the tour of James Monroe when he toured around through... Uh, he was touring the fortifications that we had right after the war of 1812 to make sure if there ever was another war with Canada, that we were good on our, nor our Northern border. Right. And so when he w went to Plattsburgh, he, he took it all the way down the river, uh, by horse and buggy, just following the river, mm -hmm. uh, down to Sackett's Harbor. And I know for a fact, he stopped and stayed at uh, Nathaniel Ford's house, who was a Colonel, uh, in Morristown. And it's rumored that he was friends with the Ogden family and stayed at the house on the Island as well. So, uh, that the the biggest the, the story I guess it's a bunch of different stories but we've always heard about the Ogden family and I always thought it was funny as a kid I go Ogden family Waddington right Ogdensburg right you exactly know? well it was one of their you know cousins that actually was the the namesake for Ogdensburg but mm -hmm. the David Ogden was one of the I believe was the first member of Congress from this area in New York State uh, to serve us on the federal level wow fascinating yeah. Josh. Probably when I started visiting Singer Castle right. on George Stad Island. And uh, I remember very, very dark nights riding with a flashlight on a tiny little John boat from Chippewa Bay out to the island and seeing that castle just appear as you come around Toothpick Island. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is just a crazy, mysterious place that I didn't even know was in my backyard growing right. up as real young. And uh, just being able to see the sights and the, and the boats go by and the, and the freighters. I just was blown away by the size of those freighters. So mm -hmm. um, that just started some kind of little nugget down way down deep mm -hmm. about there's so much to explore around here. If I had one boat, maybe not a canoe because the river gets pretty rough sometimes, yeah. but if I had a, a, a little bit larger boat, I could literally spend an entire year just making stops and doing some research and, and I would just barely scrape the surface. So oh, that, that just intrigued me. What a great discussion about the history of the St. Lawrence River. Remember, that's part one, and next time we'll have part two. There's never enough time to talk about the history of the greatest river on Earth. I'm Lori Doldo. Thanks for watching The River, living the St. Lawrence.